will now turn things over to our mayor, Mayor, mayor if you will, please. Thank you, Matt, and thank you so much for all the work that you put into this tremendous conference. I see a lot of wonderful faces here this morning, uh, and it's great to see all of you. So uh, good morning to those of you who I see often around this community, and welcome to the visitors over here today in Richmond uh, to see the beautiful sights of our city and to learn through this conference how you can empower your own community. Quality of place uh, plays a very, very key role in today's economy. We are dealing with a, a younger workforce that are taking their careers with them and choosing where to live and where to be and where to make their home. And they take their career with them digitally. And so having a strong hold on quality of place plays a very key role in how your city will grow and change and how it will attract economic development uh, in the new age of the economy. So uh, I think Richmond gets a lot of these key factors right and we still have a lot to learn. So I hope that you learn a lot here today uh, from some of the things that we have done and some of the things that you can talk about together. So thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for bringing this wonderful room of minds together to talk about how to make communities better and stronger and more viable uh, in today's economic age. And just, uh, I really appreciate seeing you all here today. I hope you have a great conference. And one of the key roles in this entire quality of place sphere is uh, your elected officials. I am here to be a partner and a conduit to what you want to see grow and happen in your community. So uh, if there are things that you want to see in Richmond to help you achieve those, uh, those pieces that will help you make those changes that you want to see in the world, then you come and talk to me and I will do everything that I can to break down the barriers uh, to help you make those changes and make this into a community that we all love very much. So that's what I'm here to do. So my door is always open to each and every one of you to make Richmond even better than it already is. So thank you again for being here and I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Good. My name is Ron Stegall, uh, and I was born in Richmond 79 years ago, and I'm Matt Stegall's cousin. Those are the three reasons that he invited me. His hope is that because I'm the oldest person in the room, um, that uh, I might have some perspectives to offer. It helps that I've done this for him before. 30 years ago, Bob Kessler and I were part of one of the first conferences here on the sustainable future of agriculture and the town. Um, it also helps that um, that I've worked in 12 countries around the world. I've, I have, or 30 countries around the world. I've lived in 12 of them and I've traveled in many more. So Matt is hoping that I can bring a global perspective to the discussions today. I live on the down east coast of Maine and I've lived there since uh, 2000 full time. And my focus there is, as it has been in many of the places around the world where I've worked, it's on the vitality of the local economic and cultural life, on inclusiveness rather than exclusiveness, and on building community. It's been a wonderful life. I agreed to come out here and leave the coast of Maine in early September when it's beautiful there because I wanted to meet you because I have a, a real appreciation for the kinds of questions you're asking that you came here to, to deal with and I congratulate you on being here. It is um, it's the most important work I think we have to do in the world today to be present as uh, citizens 
of people of all ages working together to improve our communities for everyone who lives in them. So this is not a day out of the office or out of the classroom. This is a day for commitment and rededication, and it has the potential to be life-changing for you and, more importantly, for many others. So climb out of the busy river of your life and sit for a day on the bank. To sit here and use the day to reshape your perspectives and to re-energize. You know what is on the program by topic, there's no, and you also have bios, so there's no need to introduce all the speakers. I do hope you will allow me to make a few suggestions about how you might use this day, how you approach it. I've been enormously fortunate to have all the global experiences that have come my way. In part, it's because I was never able to hold a job for very long. It's also because I've made real efforts to listen carefully as I went along, to try to hear the thinking behind what I was hearing, and to hear what was really being said. So that's my first suggestion, listening more effectively. You're going to hear and you're going to have a large number of great ideas today. And you've been given a resource sheet or sheets that are going to introduce you to many more, to books, websites, articles, blogs, networks, courses, conferences mentors, colleagues, sources you may not have heard of before. I hope you'll pay attention to all the doors that could open for you when you leave this conference because of the keys you've been presented today. Follow up. Follow up. Follow up. There'll be an opportunity, as Matt said, to talk with all the speakers. We'll gather in this room right across the way here, and there'll be separate tables. Speakers will distribute themselves among the tables and approach anyone you want to and join in whatever conversation is going on. But while you are hearing the examples of innovative solutions, ways of thinking about problems, new paradigms, new approaches, realign your thinking so that you're focused on learning to ask better questions, not on finding answers. If you're asking better questions, you're probably making progress toward asking the right question. And the answers, tentative though they may be, will follow. While preparing yourself to ask better questions, listen carefully for the clues about how to actually put into practice the good ideas you're having. What was the thinking behind the innovation? And what was the process that the innovators went through to make it happen? Next, everything is related to everything else. I had a teacher here in the Richmond school system who said to me, Ron, if you're really lucky, by the time you graduate from college, you will understand that everything you've studied and every experience you've had is related in some way to everything else you've studied and every other experience you've had. I still make discoveries on that subject. Let this day be another lesson. Think globally, act locally. It's an old bromide, I know. 
But it's never been more important, folks. We have to regain respect for facts and information and understand that the local community in which we live is not called Richmond or Muncie or Cincinnati or Madison. It's called the planet Earth. What happens around the globe affects our daily lives. And narcissism, xenophobic ideologies, short-term thinking, are destructive forces that corrupt our creativity and block human progress. Finally, think like a watershed. Listen to what rivers have to tell you. And take a walk in the forest. It is the poet in each of you and your growing capacity to hear other poets that will make all the earlier suggestions I've given you usable and worth your effort. Poetry is woven in and around the other cultural endeavors you will hear about today. Dance, music, art, ecology, film, environmentalism, architecture, engineering, community organization, innovation, creativity, and especially politics. I have a 22-year-old friend who is an intern on an organic farm near me on Deer Isle, Maine. Galen just returned from a year as a Watson Fellow, a program that might interest some of you students. In the Watson Fellowship, you make an application, and if you win, you get the opportunity to spend a year anywhere in the world doing anything you want to do. Galen has just returned from a year. He said in his application, what I want to do is to visit the great rivers of the world and hear what they have to tell me. His blog is listed in your resources and his poetry. I, I invite you to spend some time with this 22-year-old fellow on a farm in Deer Isle, Maine, and let him encourage you to experience the world in a new way, to ask better questions. Many of you have already read The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Wollenden. Peter is a forester who awakened from the calculations of bored feet to a realization that a forest is an intelligent, feeling community. Sharing information and research Wollenden calls the wood wide web The forest community cooperates so as to ensure that each tree can grow into the best tree it can be. Trees communicate in many ways. They create the diversity needed by sharing nutrients and medicines with each other across species. They are not only intelligent, but caring. Sick individuals are supported and nourished until they recover. It takes an entire community of species to create an ideal, sustainable habitat. Therefore, every individual is valuable to the community and worth keeping around as long as possible. Think like a forest. So, today we contemplate sustainable communities and our global future. 
so doing, we must focus again on diversity. Because diversity is the sustainer, the activator. Uh, uh, diversity has as its sustainer and activator respect for others. That's the foundation. And it must be the core of all the action that results from this conference. The ecosystem knows best. Now at this point, Bob Kester is going to come up and talk with you about some other tools and approaches and ways to sort things out. And then Christian Vasi from York, England, and really from the European community uh, is going to raise the curtain on everything that's happening in Europe. Thank you for being here and giving me a reason to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ron. That's a great uh, introduction, as always. Uh, poetically assembled and uh, beautifully constructed. Uh, it reminds me of a mentor of mine who once said that uh, life is an aesthetic experience. And I think that's a good watchword for uh, what we do. So thank you for the, uh, the opening. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is walk through uh, 20 slides. Uh, this is for the sake of my students. I, encourage them when they make presentations to use only 20 slides and give each one 20 seconds. So in six minutes and 40 seconds, I will go through, ideally, uh, an overview of this uh, quality of place concern as it relates to sustainability. Uh, here you see on the right an Indian settlement, a couple of plumes of smoke. They're living on an island which in their language was called Manahatta. Uh, 200 and some years later on the left is what's there. Uh, we occupied this island back uh, soon after the birth of our country and in 200 and some years uh, we built a lot of buildings and we've consumed a lot of land and we also have some smokestacks of sort <clears throat> that are emitting things out into the atmosphere but uh, the only way we can support what is now New York City is by having an enormous amount of what I call shadow acreage out somewhere else where we're growing the food, harvesting the energy, gathering the water and supplying and supporting uh, the millions of people that live here. But this is the challenge that we face. We've got uh, a natural system, which is the earth, as Ron mentioned. Uh, it's a planetary consideration that we bring to the table today and the challenge for us as architects, planners, community developers, or even citizens in those communities to understand the wholeness of this interaction between our presence on the land and the importance of what Ron described as uh, the community of nature. <clears throat> what I'm going to introduce toward the end of the slides is uh, a clarification of three important terms because unfortunately sustainability gets talked about in such a um, confusing way often that we lose sight of the definition. The term sustainable, in fact, has very little uh, credence for a lot of folks, and it's very confusing. I find it helpful to use three terms, green, sustainable, and generative, and we'll talk to that in more detail. But we'll begin uh, by talking about quality of place. As the mayor mentioned in his opening comment, uh, quality of place is a big challenge now because many uh, folks are taking their jobs with them because they have the opportunity to telecommute or work by way of the internet. And so they pick a place to live uh, such as Deer Island, Maine because they can have a wonderful life and still be maintain, maintain their connection to the world. Um, <clears throat> we start with quality of place by looking at Manhattan. We look at what's there to begin with, nature. Uh, the climate, of course, is a measure uh, of everything, and climate change is underway. But we also look at the landscape 
the physi physiography of where we're occupying a part of the Earth. And uh, that's a very standard way of doing an index or an assessment of how we begin to shape or understand the quality of place of our community. We also want to look at the built environment, the New York City of the world, if you will, um, the physical characteristics of what it is we've built there and how we've consumed, covered, or otherwise intervened in the operations of nature. And uh, depending upon how well that is done, it can uh, strengthen or detract uh, from its appeal for visitors or those that might want to reside. Of course, quality of place is not just the physiography of nature and the physiography of the built world. <clears throat> it's also the social dimensions. <clears throat> and it includes uh, the cultural uh, aspects of a community, the amenities, the restaurants, museums, theaters, galleries, uh, the festivals that are staged every year, historic sites that are preserved and maintained, and of course the diversity, as Ron mentioned, of our population, uh, diversity being a measure of health. And of course tradition becomes another important metric. Uh, in an oral culture, traditions are handed down verbally. There is no written word. Uh, folks are schooled in what their community has come to learn, and it's passed on uh, by way of oral tradition. But uh, in our world, Western society at least, we've got much written. But in either case, uh, we are a network of uh, individuals and sub-communities within communities, and our social capital is built on trust, and reciprocity, and the degree to which we can engage uh, our civic life in an effective way. All of that lays a groundwork for what economic development folks would refer to as business attraction, uh, the degree to which uh, highly educated workers are seeking a place to function, the degree to which research universities can undergird development in a community, the degree to which uh, the well-being of residents is a primary consideration. Most corporations now, as well as our own universities, have wellness programs. Uh, the idea is that we're trying to uh, assure the health of people that are living and working there. And as Ron mentioned, taking a walk in the woods, which the Japanese refer to as forest bathing, is a very necessary thing to do often. And uh, there's a famous quote, I think it's accurate, from Einstein who said, if you want to have ideas, don't walk to the chalkboard. Take a walk in the woods. Technology, of course, is another thing that undergirds our presence uh, here on Earth. Um, there are a lot of technology and knowledge-based industries now that are and businesses that are finding and looking for places to be. Um, the traditional factors of transportation costs and proximity to resources is much less a concern these days. In fact, the big push is to localize resource cycles and to really focus on the well-being and quality of life of community residents. And of course, it's important to realize that our community is not an isolated island. It's one of many in a given region. So we refer to Muncie as being in East Central Indiana. Uh, to some degree, Richmond is part of that. Um, Southern Indiana has its own topography and geography, uh, given the fact that the glaciation didn't get that far, so it didn't get scraped flat. It's still highly differentiated. Uh, so we have a region in which our city or community is located, and it's important to notice that our community is one of many in that region. So we have regional identity as well as community identity, and that regional perception can affect uh, the influence and understanding of folks who are looking for a place to live and looking for a community that wants to redevelop. And then the rural versus urban conversation gets at uh, natural amenities still, but also uh, the character of uh, how the community is growing. There are some communities that uh, establish zero growth boundaries, meaning that they will not expand beyond the current built edge of the fabric of the community. They will not consume more farmland. They will not consume more waterways. They, in fact, will work to redevelop and reinvigorate uh, the community that's there. I find it helpful in that discussion to draw an analogy to the growth and development of human beings. 
We start off as babies, we grow to a certain size, but we continue to grow intellectually, emotionally, socially. So we switch from growth to development. So economic development doesn't necessarily mean physical growth. It means enrichment and maturity and cultivation. So uh, that I find to be a helpful marker for how to reinvigorate an existing community. Now, there's a thing that's happening around the, the world that's referred to as the Bilbao effect. <clears throat> this is a museum in Spain, in Bilbao, that was designed by a star architect, a star architect um, named Frank Gehry, uh, who's done a range of uh, remarkable buildings all around the globe, the Disney Concert Hall and the Stata Center at MIT and a bunch of other things. Uh, but this building uh, came up uh, about a d 10 years ago or so, and it's a titanium-covered, highly sculpted, um, remarkable museum that was very expensive, paid for by the Guggenheim Foundation. But since that building was constructed in that small waterfront town of Bilbao, tourism has gone up 2,500% because everybody wants to go see that building. And this now has become a watchword in economic development circles. Can we achieve the Bilbao effect? Can we do something locally that will, in fact, pull people here because it's so unique and so remarkable? Now, <clears throat> this was a happenstance event. Uh, the museum was designed and constructed by uh, the Guggenheim folks. Um, they didn't do it to increase tourism, they did it because they wanted to have a museum. But the idea of the Bilbao effect now is current in development circles. And it takes odd direction. This is Casey, Illinois. This is their attempt at the Bilbao effect. They've built a bunch of big objects. And they've made the place a carnival atmosphere-like enough that people will pay to drive there and go visit, take pictures by the big rocking chair, the big mailbox, and so forth, and uh, walk away with a handful of nice images. And their tourism is going up. But uh, my argument would be that neither of these strategies, either a Guggenheim Museum nor these artifacts in a small town, are the way to think about giving quality of place its due. Rather, I think we have to pay attention to the development idea. How do we not grow, but develop our community? This uh, you'll hear about more from uh, Christian when he speaks soon. Uh, this is his hometown in England, York. What you notice here is people walking on a wall, which used to be the defensive battlement against intrusion, because at one point York was a walled city. Uh, the wall was not torn down in order to build a new high-rise or a Guggenheim, rather it was maintained and the city has developed and enriched itself and it too has a Bilbao effect. People go to York because it's such a wonderful physical, social, cultural environment. So that's really the challenge. How do we maintain and preserve what's so strong in what we have in our communities and then move that forward in a way that uh, enriches what already exists? Quality of place can be described as then a public good, the degree to which uh, collective decisions by everyone in the community yields something good for all. As Ron was saying, our decisions affect others. We're not just an island unto ourselves. And so the public sector is that vehicle where we can have this kind of conversation. And this gathering today is an example of that. And there's an economic good to quality of place, which can be measured in terms of uh, economic value. Scarcity becomes uh, a critical thing uh, in establishing the dollar value of uh, something. But also, um, price premiums are paid uh, for being near wonderful features. I'm sure in York, England, living near the wall would be preferred to not being in its view. So. Uh, those are examples. So a definition then for today would be uh, 
quality of place is tied to the immeasurable, the essence. You get beyond the physiography, beyond the Manhattan or the New York City, and talk about what it's like to live in the community, that becomes the thing that folks remember, how vibrant it was, how distinctive it was. If you think about New Orleans, those that have had a chance to go there, you remember hearing the jazz mus music, you remember um, getting uh, freshly caught seafood. Uh, it's the experience of the place. It's not so much the physicality only. And given that immeasurable dimension, it seems to me sustainability then becomes the watchword. How do we sustain and maintain and enrich uh, communities? So I would propose that it's helpful to use a simple language. And so there are three words that we'll discuss. Green, sustainable, and generative. Green is a term for materiality. This podium I'm standing at is made of wood. Did this wood come from Indiana? Or was it shipped in from somewhere offshore? Uh, on the upper left, you see a picture of a house that was designed and built by Frank Lloyd Wright in Phoenix, uh, in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. A really unusual house. Uh, you don't see one built this way anywhere else. If you look at those walls, what you realize is that he used local materials. He took the boulders that were laying on the desert floor, he rolled them together, put up some formwork, threw in some mortar, and cast a wall that was of the desert. If you look at the roof, you'll see that it's just stretched canvases. If you take a frame of wood, stretch canvas over it, and use them in shingle style on the roof, you can get great translucent light in the drafting space. You can open them and get ventilation. It doesn't rain there very often, and it's not a very cold climate, so you don't have to insulate much. So he actually designed the house. He found the spirit of the house, the essence of the house, in the character of the desert. Found materiality and the use of that materiality to make an invented new type of building. So green material sourcing becomes uh, pretty powerful uh, when you're thinking about community development. Now, in the middle top slide, you see this beautiful glass chapel. It's an open air chapel where uh, folks in the community can gather for various services. And you look at that beautiful glass ceiling and you just wonder how they conceived of it. Well, they went to the junkyard and they grabbed a bunch of windshields off of cars and they shingled them and hung them on a metal frame and they created a glass chapel by repurposing material. On the right you see stranded material which on the lower right can be used to make micro lamb lumber. So thin layers of material that otherwise would, in this case that would be discarded, can actually be repurposed and reused and taken to a higher level of service. Carpet in the middle bottom made of recycled fishing nets this is of interface flooring. They have a net works program. They pay villagers to go out into the ocean and pull nets that were abandoned by fishing companies, bring them to interface. They break them down and reweave them into carpeting. And they sell you the carpet not as a product but as a service. So when it stops functioning well, it gets worn out, you stain it with a spilled drink, you call them up and say, we need four more tiles over here and three more tiles over there. They deliver them, they take back the damaged ones, and they repurpose those again. So they're selling you the use of the carpet, not the object of carpet. So green material sourcing becomes an important way to talk about potential economic development, regional and uh, climatic fit, and uh, spiriting of job creation within the local area. On the lower left, you see a bamboo forest. Bamboo grows very quickly. It's very strong, and it can be repurposed uh, in many ways. The second term is sustainability itself. Sustainability is really a description of the balance of flow. So if you think about your checkbook, uh, it, does your expense equal your income? Are you spending more than you earn? That's what we've been doing on the earth. We've been consuming more materials than we've been allowing nature to replace them. So we've been in deficit mode. The cha challenge is to balance the flow. 
So we want to harvest local materials. We want to use materials that can replenish themselves. And we want to work in a way that uh, our income doesn't, uh, our expense doesn't exceed our income. This is a building in Manhattan. Uh, this is the Audubon headquarters. That existing building was repurposed and brought back to life with really wonderful lighting uh, interventions. And they have these tubes where you can recycle your various plastics, paper, and glass on the office floor. And so everything about this building is balance of flow. They're maintaining and re rejuvenating an old building. And they're trying to manage the flow of light from nature so that they don't have to turn on electrical lighting uh, to compensate. And then the final term is generative. To what extent can a building give back more than it takes? That's the challenge for architects. And here's a simple way to conceive that. If you think of a tree with a lot of leaves, you can use it as an, uh, a metaphor or even an analog for the electrical grid. Uh, right now in uh, Florida and in Texas, we've got problems with the electrical supply because the grid went down. So various buildings are not getting power, and even the cell towers aren't working. All of those buildings and cell towers are pulling from the grid to function. A tree has a bunch of leaves. Leaves are akin to the buildings. So you've got a bunch of buildings on a system of support, just like leaves are on a tree, buildings are on a grid, electrical grid. The difference is, in nature, every leaf is the power plant. It's the giver, not the taker. It's producing the power or the, the life of the tree. It's not sucking it out of the grid. So if in Irma or Harvey, buildings X, Y, and Z were damaged, buildings A, B, and C are still feeding into the system, perhaps. And we know that if a tree branch gets removed, the tree is still viable. So the analogy there is, if every building became a power plant and could give back more than it takes, we would have a viable community system. What you see in the middle bottom is uh, a project in Brooklyn, New York. It's called uh, Gotham Greens. It's an old industrial building that was repurposed as a food production facility and they now sell high quality greens to all the restaurants in Manhattan. On the lower left, you see a picture of uh, a sewage treatment facility in the Adam Joseph Lewis Center in Oberlin, Ohio. I'll come back to that in a second. And on the right, you see the green roofs of Chicago. The goal of Chicago is for every building to become a green roof. This is the Adam Joseph Lewis Center. It treats its own waste and produces its own power. It is a leaf on a tree. This is its dashboard. And on Wednesday, I took this snapshot, and it was producing more power than it was consuming. It has its sewage waste treatment facility on site. It turns out plants like all the stuff in dirty water. So the plants take up the nutrients, and what you get left with is drinkable, clean water. So they're treating their own sewage with their recycling of the living machine, and they're producing their own power with solar panels that are on their roof and over a parking area. So this is an example of giving back more than taking. So three key words. If nothing else, when you leave today from my talk anyhow, keep this in mind. Green, sustainable, generative. To what extent is the material locally sourced and reusable? To what extent are the flows of energy, water, light, and such balanced? And to what extent is the building giving back more than it's taking? I think that becomes the framework from which we can talk about further quality of place development. So thank you very much. Christian will be up talk with you. <clears throat>
maybe most important for you is that I spent eight years as a politician, helping to run the city of York, which you've just seen a picture of, a city of 200,000 people. And I can tell you as an artist, it was a very unusual thing to turn up in a city and be a politician. There was no one there. I was stunned. There was no one there who was really grappling with ideas and strategies. There was no one who was chomping at the bit to hear the kind of things that Ron and Bob have spoken about. It's a real challenge. And ultimately, a friend of mine said, we're not really waiting for the technologies to arrive that will enable us to create a sustainable future. All the technologies already exist. The only challenge we have is persuading each other to implement them. So I will be uh, presenting to you some of the things that I learned about how to persuade people to move together towards uh, a sustainable future. In practical examples, some very small, some very big. Um, before I start, I should offer some perspective. Maybe four years ago, I sat down with my three daughters, and we were struggling to understand why it's so difficult to get us all to act together on things like climate change, on our global challenges. And we gave ourselves a little test. We compared England, where I live, to an American state. We picked North Dakota, but let's use Indiana. England has a population of about 55 million people. It has an area of 50,000 square miles. Indiana, you have a th an area of 37,000 square miles and a population, if I'm right, of about 6.6 .6 million. Ten times fewer people. The last time England had a population density, the equivalent of Indiana's, was 300 years ago. They'd had it once in the 13th century, they'd got up to 6 million. Then the plague arrived and the population halved. And it took another 300 years to get back to 6.6 .6 million. If you look at it from a European uh, perspective compared to the States, the difference is equally vast. At a European level, we have a, an area of 1.7 million square miles and a population of, where are my figures, 511 million people. That's a population density of about 300 people per square mile. In the US, you have 3.8 million square miles and a population of, you'll know better than me, 320 million. Uh, that's a population density of uh, 90 people per square mile. If we go to Australia, the population density is eight people per square mile. And what we discovered in North Dakota was that the population density is about 11 people per square mile. So we can all share a similar feeling about wanting to love our planet and wanting to look after our environment and everything, um, but we're bound to have very different perspectives on concepts like what is pollution, what is biodiversity loss? What is loss of forest cover? It's very different from place to place. All of this matters because if we're going to be able to talk together and, and work together, we have to somehow get to grips with that. And with my daughters, we were talking about, well, we have to accept that someone who lives in an environment that has 20 times more trees is bound to see the world slightly differently and we will have to make new efforts to communicate with each other. And what is true between nations or between states is equally true within the microcosm of a city. Because every part of a city that we inhabit has different numbers of trees, different types of building, different levels of insulation, different incomes. Um, and I want to put it to you, I put this towards the end of my speech, but I'll say it right now because I think it's, it's very important. A city ultimately is not a collection of buildings. It's a collection of people. And 
the riches of Richmond or the riches of York are not the riches of its beautiful architecture in my city, of its beautiful architecture in your city. That is not the riches of your city. The richness of your city lies in the people and what you find the capacity to do together. So, how do we face up to climate change? Well, most of us like to go through a whole chain of excuses. I could rehearse them, you've probably heard them all. Let's assume we've done the excuses now. Um, how can we move forwards together? Well, the important thing is that we, we look um, towards practical examples. Because if we talk in the abstract, um, it's a great thing to do. But ultimately, the challenge is not the beautiful building. It's getting people to want the beautiful building. It's not the new cycle network, it's getting people to want a cycle network. And that's what my job was in the city of York. And through my work with the city of York, I had the huge privilege by creating our city's first environmentally sustainable building to be invited to towns and cities across Europe to talk about how we did what we did. And in doing that, I met hundreds of mayors in other cities and have learnt a huge amount. And what I want to do is present to you a couple of examples of what we did in York and what I've seen in Europe and refer you to the resources list that I've given you. Because the resources list is packed with short films and two databases. And ultimately, I cannot know what is best for your community. You know what's best for your community but I'm going to steer you towards these databases of practical things that 7,500 cities have done across Europe for you to find out what those solutions are that might be applicable to you, and then to spread those with your family, your friends, your colleagues at work, your city council, so that you can implement them in your own cities. Um, a friend of mine said that uh, national governments are okay. But the bottom line is that action on tackling our environmental challenges, on improving energy efficiency, on increasing renewable energy, uh, on all these things does not happen at national level. Nations, governments, national governments can pass legislation, but the practical implementation of change happens in cities and in communities. And I think there's a great truth in that. He was so persuasive that he persuaded the European Commission and the European Parliament to change all their legislation to face towards cities and towards empowering cities to implement change. And that was a phenomenal achievement. And there are now, in one of the organizations we'll look at in a while, uh, seven and a half thousand cities that represent almost half the population of the European Union, committed to implementing change, producing action plans that they share with all the citizens of Europe, that's all available, as a result of my friend Gérard Magnat's determination to put cities and communities at the heart of implementing change. Um, the first thing I want to then say about um, how to make these things happen is don't worry about people's motivation. Far too many of us, I'm included, who are passionate about the environment, think that, thing, that things will change if we can persuade people around us to see the world we, the way we see it. We want people to say, yes, yes, you know, I, I'd love it. If everyone I know said, Christian, you're absolutely right on climate change. I've been an idiot. Um, I'm now ready to do whatever you say because I've seen the light. Uh, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for me. It's not going to happen for you. And beyond a certain point, so what? What does it matter why people make a decision to transform their environment, to transform their city? Uh, surely what matters is making the change. Why people do it? I don't give a stuff. It doesn't matter. Um, 
no one wants to admit they're wrong. And the other problem that environmentalists often bring to the table is we like to tell people that the world is in a very dark place. And that if we don't act quickly, it's all going to fall apart. And we're on our way now, spiraling down towards the cataclysm. Um, it's my experience that nurturing pessimism is seldom the path towards passionate enthusiasm. So just ditch it. It doesn't help. Most people are not going to be uplifted by the prospect that the world is about to end. So why do we do it? Um, I went to Thailand earlier this year as part of my work, and I was advised before I left to be careful not to force a Thai person to lose face because they can't handle it. Like there's a country on earth where people like to lose face. <laughs> oh, that made me feel so stupid. I feel great. I'm from Europe. Great. Um, so here, the first thing I want to show you is a short film I made in Italy about three small communities where they have embraced renewable energy. Um, before I show, there's a couple of things I'll say as well because I think they're helpful pointers for you maybe in the future. I made five films in, six films in five countries as part of this project. You'll find them in your, your resource packs. Um, one key thing I decided before I started filming was that every time I met someone in a suit and tie from the purposes of producing this film, I said, can you take the jacket off and the tie? Because in the context of this film, I want many people to see this, and I want them to listen to you and your voice. What I don't want to, them to do is to see your authority. I don't want them to know you're the mayor. I don't want them to know you're the energy manager. I want them to realize that you're one of the citizens involved in this community, and you have something to contribute, just like the next person, and everyone is equal. Abbiamo scommesso sulle energie rinnovabili e cerchiamo un, un viaggio. Vogliamo cercare di portare questo paese ad un livello di vita adeguato, un livello di vita che non è soltanto la sopravvivenza ma che è lanciato verso il futuro. Con queste energie noi che cosa stiamo facendo? Rinnoviamo con i ragazzi attraverso i parchi giochi, attraverso il sostegno che diamo nella scuola materna con la mense. Abbiamo fatto questa scelta tanti tanti anni fa perché noi vogliamo riuscire a sopravvivere come sentinella di un territorio, sostenere tutte le attività economiche che in, nel prossimo futuro si potranno sviluppare nel territorio e questo ci dà anzi la certezza di avere un vero e proprio futuro. Noi abbiamo un introito di 180.000 euro all'anno che servono, uno, per mantenere al minimo le tasse comunali e quindi non ci sono addizionali e parlo di TOSAP, tassa sull'immondizia, tasse scolastiche, quindi miglioramento del servizio scolastico e investimenti sul sociale. Due, che ti dà facilmente accesso ai mutui perché hai la potenzialità di pagare la rata eh, del mutuo stesso. Oggi vi sto ospitando in un terreno dove sarà realizzato un parco urbano con i proventi della centrale eolica. L'amministrazione comunale ha individuato tre primi grandi interventi. Il primo è stato fatto sulle scuole medie ed elementari, che è nell'edificio adiacente al comune, al municipio. 
Il secondo tipo di intervento è stato fatto sugli impianti sportivi e questo ha permesso di alimentare e quindi risparmiare energia eh, riguardo a tutte le attività che vengono svolte nei nostri impianti sportivi nella cittadella dello sport. Il terzo intervento è stato fatto presso il cimitero comunale. Io ho creduto all'impianto fotovoltaico, ho messo quindi 11 kW sopra la mia abitazione. Ho messo inseguitori, tre inseguitori a un terreno adiacente alla casa. Allora, la scelta del fotovoltaico nel paese di Ancarano è soprattutto per un senso di responsabilità, per l'ambiente, per, per i propri figli. È una cosa che io non ci credevo, però fai una cosa, prova e vedrai. Poi quando ci rincontreremo direi grazie perché avendo un'attività artigianale sotto casa sfrutto sia diciamo, a livello artigianale che a livello privato l'abitazione. È un anno che ce l'ho e l'ho fatto mettere anche mia madre adesso. E... Cioè quindi se non lo faccio sarei un pazzo in poche parole, lo devo fare. Devi fare. Allora mi sa che mi avete convinto ragazzi, io posso dire solo grazie e mi gioco questo. Eh, lo oh. La nostra comunità ha capito l'importanza dell'energia rinnovabile, non solo può essere utilizzata nelle sue grandi dimensioni, nelle sue grandi forme, ma può essere utilizzata anche a livello residenziale. Vorremmo che tutte le regioni d'Europa fossero come la regione Abruzzo, sensibili alle energie rinnovabili. Thank you. What could be better than persuading a bunch of men to play my solar panel arrays bigger than yours as a game in a community? Uh, what a great place to go. Um, you'll notice that hardly anyone talks about the environment or carbon emissions. They were busy improving their schools, creating parks, creating a new canteen, a building for people to, for the local marching band. Um, They were even putting solar panel arrays in the cemetery. I, I never found out why. Um, they were creating vibrant communities where young people would stay instead of moving away. That first place we looked at, their population had been declining. And they were looking for ways to turn it around. And by putting the wind turbines on a hill, they were generating money to enable them to invest in their community and produce community benefits that would encourage young families to return or to stay. That's what mattered to them. No one was talking about, um, oh, my panels are kind of 11% efficient, and, well, the men might have done if I'd kind of kept going. But um, they were talking about the community and the point of investing in all this renewable energy as a resource way beyond the discussion about protecting the environment. And that's fine with me, and it should be fine with you. What matters is that those three towns are thriving, that they're developing new jobs, there are many jobs being created in the Abruzzo region servicing this shift towards renewable energy, and they're reducing carbon emissions. We're all going in the same direction. Who cares why we're doing it? Um, the next, oh, well, it, this is another metaphor I've just scribbled down here. When we want to improve the energy efficiency of a building, some of us want to do it to save polar bears. Some of us do it because we want to keep warm, because we're in poor housing. Some of us just want to save money. All of it is good. And that's true for all cities and all communities everywhere. The next thing I want to talk about is empowering others. Because that's part of what I was doing with these films and that's part of my brief. And I think it's critical to the whole of this discussion. The top-down imposition of solutions by people in power feels very good for the people at the top. It leaves very often everyone else in the dark. They don't understand any more when the building has been put up or the new cycle wave has been created. They don't have any more understanding then than they did before as to why it matters, how it happened, what part they could have played in making happen another project like it. So here are a few small practical examples of what I did in York. Um, 
as I, say, as I said, I was a politician for eight years. And I was always looking for small things as well as big things. I had a dream that I could do three or four amazing things every year as a politician. Then I grew up. If you can do one amazing thing a year, you're really, really successful as a politician. One of the small things I did that had a huge, huge impact was I was for two years the executive member for leisure, culture, and social inclusion. A big portfolio. I was one of seven people running the city, and I still wanted to do something about the environment. So I sat down with the various teams I had to work with, and we devised a scheme called the Smart Meter Library Scheme. We spent probably in the region of about $3,000 buying 150 smart meters. I tried them out in my own house. I thought, how does my fridge freezer work? Where am I wasting money in my house? So I spent 20 pounds on one of these devices. We plugged it in. Within two days, we'd learned that our fridge freezer was costing us around $200 a year to power with electricity because it was 10 years old. The, my, the meter, the normal meter in my house, didn't give me that information at all. I had no idea how my house spends my money. As soon as I got my smart meter, I knew. The next day we went out, we bought a new fridge freezer. It cost about $300. Within two years, we'd paid that money back and we've been saving ever since. And I wanted to give that to everyone in my community. So we bought 150 smart meters and we made them available to everyone in York as easily as you borrow a library book. For free, you could go into the library, borrow a smart meter for a week, take it home with an information pack to tell you how to use it and how you could save money. Within three months, thousands of York residents had borrowed these. They were out all the time. You couldn't go into the library and look at a spread of them and say, I think I'll have this one. They were never there. They were always borrowed. Within six months, the project had been copied in 30 councils across the United Kingdom. By the autumn, I was invited to speak to the conference of national, the National Conference of Head Librarians to tell them what this was. And within two years, I'd spoken to cities across Europe and was helping the city of Bielsko Biala in Poland initiate their own scheme. It started with just $3,000 expenditure. It's empowered tens of thousands of people. There are now people everywhere who understand how their house works. When they hear the council say, I think we should tackle climate change, or should we tackle climate change, or do we need a more energy efficient building, there are now tens of thousands of environmentally and energy literate people in the community who get it because they've made it work in their own homes. Little things can have a massive impact and little things can change the world. Uh, just two weeks ago I was in a conversation with some politicians because I thought, oh, maybe I should have another go at this. I haven't done it since 2011. I went to a meeting and they said, why do you want to be a councillor? And I said, I still want to change the world. And the councillor looked straight at me and said, no, we can't do that here and we don't want to. <laughs> Those are the obstacles you face if you want to change a city. Not all politicians. There are good and bad everywhere. But to lift politicians, we need to lift the community so that they can lead the politicians. Um, OK, the next thing here. Uh, oh yes, a little note to self. The pendulum that swings only in one direction. It's a metaphor that kind of came together while I was working and helped steer my thoughts. In politics, um, whenever you propose something, it is, it is perceived in politics that it's the job of everyone who wears a different colored badge to say the opposite. So if you're the party in power and you say, let's increase recycling by 5%, most politicians will see it as their job, if they're not in the uh, administration, to say the public 
is fed up with recycling. We don't want any more of this stuff. It'll stink the backyard. Um, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. It doesn't work. A, a thousand reasons why not to increase recycling. But think of this. If whenever you talk to politicians, whenever you go to your city council, you make the effort to talk to all the politicians, not just the person in charge, all the politicians, then when the party in charge says, we want to increase recycling by 5%, the opposition have a choice. They can either say, the public hates recycling, we don't want to do it, it stinks in the backyard, blah, blah, blah. Or they can say, why only 5%? Don't you know how this works? Why not 10%? Haven't you read what they've done in Hamburg, in Minneapolis, whatever it is? You could do better than this. And they can go on the radio and say, the ruling administration is total rubbish in this city. They're proposing a 5% increase. We know you could have 10%. And they can explain why. So I urge you all to, to park party politics, whatever your party, wherever you're from. If quality of place matters, talk to everyone. Allow all politicians to become informed, just as we can all seek to ensure the whole community is informed. Um, where am I going now? Oh, right, two databases. I just want to steer you towards what I've put in, in that resource pack. Um, the first of them is for the Covenant of Mayors. Very strange name. It was created uh, by a friend of mine. Well, I was, in fact, part of the, the working group that hatched the idea, which was a huge privilege. The idea was to get cities to, com to, to commit to reducing carbon emissions, to increasing renewable energy, and to uh, tackle climate change. And very, very quickly it's escalated into something huge because the European Union as an organization recognized the value of this. So if you want to borrow money for your city in the European Union, um, you can go to the European Central Bank, one of the many things that you can look to. Thanks to the Covenant of Mayors, the European Commission and the European Parliament changed the rules so that the European Bank gives preference to development projects that are proposed and advanced by members of the Covenant of Mayors, because they know that it's part of the remit of all those cities to act to protect their environment and move the continent forwards. Um, so I urge you to look at that. Um, it's a great resource. Uh, there are 6,000 action plans you can find in there for all these cities. There will be things in there that are useful to you. They're in 27 languages, but just use Google Translate and you will be able to read them. Um, the second database is related to that one, and it is the Energy Cities database, a thousand cities. Um, this is particularly useful to you because the database is organized by theme and not by just this, this is what a city wants. So if you're interested in um, how to produce an energy audit that identifies all the energy and material flows within a council area, you can do it there. If you want to find out about smart grids and waste recovery plants and public-private partnerships and how they were implemented in a city of 40,000 people or 100,000 people, you can find it there. Um, use it to educate yourselves, use it to help your council to inform itself and to learn. I've used it to give homework to my fellow colleagues and we played a competitive game of come back in a month and tell me the great things you've discovered. It's fantastic. People come back who've previously shown no interest and they will have great pleasure in telling you something you didn't know about how to save money in your city. Um, to finish, Use those databases wisely. Use them intelligently. Distribute them sneakily. Um, better than seeking to impose change on a community is to transform all our understanding. We don't need to wait until coal and oil runs out before making the shift to our low-carbon future. As someone wiser than me said a decade ago, 
the Stone Age didn't end because they ran out of stones. We are at a period where many people view the future only with fear. We need to turn this round, support each other, inform each other. To close, I don't mean to be disrespectful. And I applaud the organisation of these events. I know exactly how difficult it is. But here's how I will look at it if you invite me again, and I hope you will. I've loved standing here in front of you, feeling important. It always feels great. I've been a politician. Um, if I return and I see fewer people like me on the podium, fewer people like us, fewer white men, middle-aged, old, and I see people from every walk of life, students, children, black faces, Hispanic faces, Asian faces, a recent incomer, someone from a poor part of town, a teacher, a whole bunch of women, up here explaining all these things, I know that you will be marching proudly and quickly to your future. Thank you.